Hey guys, my name is Kaylin and welcome to my coffee talk. If you're ever in need of a good life chat over a warm beverage, then I'm about to be your gal. You can basically think of me as your online cafe buddy, that anytime you need a boost of inspiration, a good cry, or a pep talk, you can always find me here, sitting and brewing up all of the words that you wish to hear. Here on the Coffee Talk podcast, we have four different styles of coffee brews, from coffee to espresso, decaf, and cosmic. Coffee brews talk about life experience in the real world. Espressos are all about inspiration and learning how to adult. Decaf brews are health and wellness plus all things environmental and cosmic brews are a fun brew where we talk about spiritual and supernatural things. Some of my favorite conversations that I've ever had in life have happened over warm or cozy beverages. The topics and the times where you just get mad real, mad honest, and super vulnerable about the things in life that sometimes we don't get to talk about with other people. Those are the kinds of conversations that you're going to hear here, whether they're with me or with other people that I bring on to the podcast. So grab a cup of whatever you like and let's get talking. What up, folks? My name is Open Mike Eagle, and welcome to another episode of What Had Happened Was. This is season two, episode five of our season long sit down with Mr. LP of Run the Jewels, Company Flow, and yes, Duff Jux fame. And that's the topic of this week's episode Def Jux, the legacy of Def Jux. Def Jux forever. We've already covered Cannibal Ox's The Cold Vein, of which uh, LP was a producer. We've covered LP's solo debut, Fantastic Damage. And now we're going to get into the rest of the legacy of the label that LP started. We're not going to get a chance to talk about everybody, and it's kind of a shame we had to reduce everything into this one episode anyway. But because of that, we're really kind of focusing on the tentpole artists, which means... We're not discussing my homies, Blackhead, uh, Hangar 18, Rob Sonic. Um, a lot of people are asking about Cool Compete, uh, and, and I never met him, but I think that project that he put out is really dope. But we, we didn't get a chance to touch on that either. And also, I wanted to say this. The focus of this podcast, the focus of this season is LP telling his story. I think uh, just in terms of stories of independent hip-hop and independent music, LP has a unique story that is worth celebrating and unpacking. So in service of that, I'm going to say this. If you're coming to this episode looking for some some politics, some negative shit, um, any any of the bullshit, we're not covering it. Def Jux was a label full of grown men. Um, the time that we know of them all together uh, is about musical output and for things and choices that some of those men made after that fact, um, we're not focusing on that. If you're here for that, I don't know what to tell you, man. Uh, go go find some people telling you the true story of those folks on YouTube or whatever. We're not doing that here. We're in service of uh, LP's legacy and trying to tell tell this story. Um, like I said, we covered Cannibal Ops. We covered Fantastic Damage. So we're going to get into some of the rest of the artists on Def Jux. Um, Camel Tao, rest in peace. We're going to cover copyright, RJD2, Aesop Rock, and touch on the weatherman, Mr. Liff, and MERS. And this podcast is part of my podcast network, Stony Island Audio. We're home for folks inside the hip hop universe who want to tell their own story. Shout out to Blueprint and the Logic Super Duty Tough Work. Shout out to Self Core with Baron Vaughn. Shout out to Fatherhood's Power with DJ EFN, KGB, and Manny. Digital, shout out to Can't Knock the Shuffle with Sean Cantrowitz and shout out to Dad by Rap Pod with Damone Carter, David Ma, and Nate LeBlanc. No promo this week except for this. If you're a fan of what it happened was, search merch engine what it happened was and grab a t shirt. We got what it happened was t shirts for this season and last season, art by Arthur Banak. So, if you're a fan of the podcast and you dig the art that we use for the pod cover, you can wear that. This is the podcast that you can wear. Once again, search Merch Engine What It Happened Was and get you a season one or a season two t shirt. And with that said, let's get into it. This is Def Jux Forever. I'm Open Mike Eagle. This is What It Happened Was. You gotta get some snaps 
Deluxe labor, the underground undertaker The whole cape is independent as fuck flavor Audio exhibit, visit the history To him winning without fucking with the industry And him losing without fucking with the industry No illusion, we tracing every movement in the symphony This is official from lifting of pencils Cold flow the death jugs up to the fist and the pistol I'm sending questions like infinite missiles Digging for details when stories from the past come up And if he don't remember then he has to shrug It's what the podcast does, what it happened was Good, good afternoon, good morning, good day, um, internet, whatever people is. Um, welcome to another episode of What It Happened Was with our uh, esteemed, as always, every episode guest, Mr. LP. Constantly esteemed, yes. Constantly, yeah. You Have you ever been esteemed this much in your life? Have you ever received esteem this consistently? No, it's exhausting. Yeah, I know it. I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> bringing, pe- bringing people esteem consistently is fucking yeah. excruciating for them. I've, I've learned that. <laughs> you know, I don't even know. Yeah, I don't even know if I have room for esteem after this anymore in my life. I just think it's gonna just be sh- shame. It's gonna be whatever. I, I just need sh- shame. That's to balance my, it that's out. That's my go-to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shame to balance it out. Yeah, because that's mm-hmm. kind of the the purpose of this is to bring you all of the esteem. That you have, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, the esteem you've earned, but we're giving it to you in this nice, like, overstimulating package. Sure. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're putting a bow on it. Um, yeah. After this, I'm jumping off a building. <laughs> <laughs> this, goes, this goes well. <laughs> Consider it an epitaph. Oh, my God. Uh, that is fucking incredible. So, yo. We've been, the last couple, we've been talking about uh, the magical times of the record label Def Jux, and Mm -hmm. we discussed Cannibal Ox, and we discussed Fantastic Damage, Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, we're not able to deep dive into all the projects, because it's just Mm -hmm. just too many of them. It's like too much good shit uh, that came out, too too many important records with important artists that came out. So like, to get us out of this era and giving everybody the proper respect due and the proper shouts out. The way we're going to do it is kind of just, you know, taking a moment to talk about each of like the tentpole artists on the label. And then, sure. um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the decisions that led you to have to move on from it. Mm. Um, so after Fandam came out and, and received a positive critical acclaim and all that and things are rolling, the Brooklyn spot, I'm assuming, is still popping. Like, because, mm-hmm. you know, y'all did mm-hmm. the video there. So that's still kind of the hub. Um mm. How long did you have that spot? How long was the Brooklyn spot the hub? I think I had that shit for like eight years, something like that. Maybe it was eight years. And then I moved to another spot literally on the next street over for two years or something. But yeah, no, I moved into that place when I was 19. And I was 27 when I dropped Fandem. That place went through whole company flow era. I was writing there for Fun Crusher Plus. I went through mad roommates. Eventually, right. I took it over myself, but I moved in there with, with multiple roommates. Just, just squalor for a long time, <laughs> you know? Like, it was just not a sanitary place, you know? Yeah, you, <laughs> for, got, you, got, you, you know? got grimy, you know, New York B-boy types, you know, this in and out of that place. before that. Okay, <laughs> Before that. Like, okay. I, I can't, no, I can't blame it on anybody but, but, <laughs> but, my, but youth, you know? Um, yeah. Company Flow wasn't really producing too much money yet. Yeah, it was kind of producing a little bit of money to pay some to pay the rent. I don't know if you went through this period in your twenties or whatever, your early twenties. But I, we were so broke that we would just sleep. Yeah, waking up was too expensive. Yeah, like we would literally. Yeah, man, we we would sleep until five thirty p.m. Wake up, go to the store put our money together, get a couple of bagels, a couple cups of coffee, watch the sunset, go buy a nickel bag from the dude on the corner, 
go back to the crib, smoke the nickel bag, and I make beats all night and go to sleep again and repeat. Mm -hmm. And that was basically it. Was a one it was a one meal existence. I mean, we could have had two if we weren't if we didn't need the weed. We determined that the <laughs> weed was more, you know. You know since since that was the hub that was where the creation was taking place that was where everybody came through because they knew it was cracking and y'all was rhyming and smoking and making shit mm -hmm. when you left that spot like was your new spot where did that continue or did yeah, that all kind yeah, of just yeah. wind down okay word no no that continued that continued the, the new spot had a um had a bottom level so it was like a basement basically but it was part of the apartment and it continued okay. for sure. So you, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, 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 I even brought Vast with Vast came with the with gotcha. the, to the new apartment and shit for a while. Um, Metro from SA Smash was living there for a minute, and after Kamu died, he lived there for a minute. Mm -hmm. And um, Kamu was there every day, and NASA was coming to coming to work there every day. It just continued, man. It rolled on for a few more years. Got you. Kamu was, was somebody I was planning to get to near the end of the episode, but since you brought him up, I think it's probably good that we just go ahead and start with him. Because I think that there's a story there just in terms of how you all in Brooklyn, in Step Jokes, in New York, you know, being at the Mecca, quote unquote, like how did y'all end up linking with Megahertz, which is a bunch of cats from Columbus? Yeah. What was the story on, 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 you know, New York heavyweights of the underground linking up with these super dope dudes out of Columbus and starting to make so much music together and really clicking up? The connection there was Bobito. Not only was he playing the megahertz stuff, so we, we were all up on it, but he put out, uh, he put out the megahertz shit. He put out the, the 12 inch that had a um, world premiere. Gimmicks, whack ones still ride the bills till they exceed the speed limits. When it's time to rhyme, MCs feed the mimic. But by the time they repeat what I flipped, they'll be on some more next pieces. But the world premiere was the one where we all heard um, both of those dudes for the first time, and we were like, oh shit. Mm -hmm. You know, we were listening to Bob, and if Bob played some shit, we, we knew what it was. Through that connection, Kamu got my number or some shit. Mm. He just got my number. And one day I'm just at the crib and, and um, this is like, I got to say probably, I don't remember exactly, maybe it was 99. Whatever the year was that they dropped that single, I just get a call out of nowhere and it's Kamu. And he's calling me from his day job, which is, <laughs> I think it was a water testing plant. It was a water testing facility and obviously Kamu wasn't wasn't doing shit <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he wasn't testing water <laughs> he was just he was just using the phones you know <laughs> he did all sorts of hilarious shit i think he was doing telemarketing shit like Kamu was just funny man he just called me out of nowhere he just called me and we talked for like three hours on the phone yeah. and then he came to new york and him and copy were fucking with um Eastern Conference Records and yeah. fucking with Cage. They went up and lived in, in Middletown where Cage was at in New York. And so they became friends and then we all started hanging out. Moo brought Metro in. Moo went back and forth to Ohio a few times. He came into New York. He chilled in New York for a minute. And then 9-11 uh, happened. Uh, him and Copyright were, were in a U-Haul the next day. Like, we're out. We're going, we're going back to Ohio. If I wasn't from New York, I probably right. would have gone home too. You know what I mean? Like right. for me, it was like, I'm here. I don't, there's nowhere to go. Um, right. When Moo came back, he came back with Met. We did the 12 inch with Moo. We did, we did hold the floor. You want to play my games? I'm leaving your brain choking. A slice of slit in your forehead. Slipping and token. You know, and, and we did wireless. And like, this is, you know, you all just crew. And he was trying to find his footing and trying to find something. And then when he, when he came back with the SA Smash shit that they were doing, I was like, yo, this shit is raw. This shit is hilarious. For the extremists, I shoot beams and treatment. The old flows, now reason, receiving pieces of Jesus. You never consider we figured it right. Was a spike blind with creases, pipe bomb the pieces. And it was very different than what, um, what you know, Jooks had done. It was right. much less heady. It was like more just punch you in your face, almost like a Midwestern version of the alcoholic system. Mm -hmm. So Met became part of the family immediately. That was the next body of stuff that we did with Camus. 
you know, I don't want to wash over his story too quickly. And, and that's, that's the sort thing, of and, like, and, I, and know. I know, you know, I, I, and that's that's the unfortunate thing is that um, we're, we're not going to be able to talk about him as much as 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 we should, especially given, yeah. you know, that he passed away. And, and also even because one of the things that I, I felt even from where I sat when he passed away, like even without all the way knowing it, but it's definitely reflected in what you're saying now is that in many ways, it sounds like he was one of the hearts and souls of the crew in terms of bringing people together. He was, he was, when you have someone who's, who's that, you know, where everyone gravitates toward him because he's such a live wire. He was such a, Kamu was electric and, and out of his mind in all the best ways and some of the worst ways you go to his crib and he'd be cooking salmon and shit in Williamsburg. He had like a crib in Williamsburg before anyone went to Williamsburg and like, <laughs> and like, and we were all over there and shit. And he's got like a fucking 45 in his, in his underwear. And you're just like, dude, we're n- you're not in Ohio. <laughs> like for New York, that's, that's weird and threatening. You hide your guns here. You know, he was a uh, walking around in, in cowboy boots. Kumu didn't give yeah. a flying fuck. But at the same time, he really wanted to make his mark. He was really, I think he had a little bit of that feeling of like he wasn't appreciated. Jokes was dope on one level, but on another level, some people that should have gotten attention didn't get attention. They didn't get the love. They weren't immediately right. like, put on this level that we put L and, and RJ and Ace and Lyft and Cat Ox. This was a level that I wanted to, that I thought everyone should be on. The only through line through all of this music is that I like it. That's literally what this label is. Call it a fucking ego trip, you know? But it's literally every single thing on this label, apart from a few things. But really, for the most of it, it was all just shit that I just thought was dope. And, and, you know, and, and often shit you had a hand in, if not correct, two hands. Correct. In. So, you know, that, that makes Certainly at the sense. beginning, yeah. I was deeply in, involved in, in, the, in the production of the records and the, and the creative direction of the records. Camus passing away was is part of the end of the story, I think. For sure. Mm-hmm. So, so maybe we'll double around back to that. But just real quick, I wanted to ask you because you're saying he wanted to make his mark, and to me, the development of his style is so interesting because mm-hmm. he comes in on the raw b boy shit, mm-hmm. just like like all of y'all. Everybody kind of mm-hmm. has that, but then you listen to that King of Hearts mm-hmm. album, man. Like that's some like real dope, s- special like indie sounding mm-hmm. like and, and at that time when he must have been making this there wasn't nothing else nothing. Like that happened no one was even approaching it no one had even considered even playing with it I mean, I remember, I mean, it was so, it was so ahead of its time that when Gnarls Barkley came out, we were like, that sounds like a little bit like what Kamu's been trying to, you know what I mean? Like it was before that. That was the crazy part about it is that we were all witness to the behind the scenes of him coming up with this fucking insane perspective on music that didn't match what, what he had done before. Someone's influences just clearly went completely off the rails in a different direction in a wonderful way but one that you knew when you were listening to it you were like this is the ballsiest shit i've ever heard because you gotta have so much confidence in this shit in order to present it to the people that know you as kumu the rapper but we at the same time all recognized like how brave and great it was you know and we were just like this shit is crazy and when he passed away i took it on myself to as a you know mission from god to fucking finish that record for him right so you know not only did i have to deal with the fact that you know my friend was gone but i also had to and i say had to i also chose to mix and you know put together and compile the record as we knew that he wanted it or at least that he had it in the demo and i had to make a few choices of elongating a few things and put it together and the whole thing but mostly it was just to honor what he had in his folder a kamuteo album folder it was all demo Mm -hmm. But sitting there and doing that fucking record where you got your friend basically making a weird Elvis Costello record about death, <laughs> you know, and yeah. like, but like yeah. some hybrid yeah. crazy shit that you've never heard before, but all the subject matter was really intense. It was like, death, where have you been all my life? And, uh, just all yeah. this shit. 
Kill me, kill me. Come on and kill me. Kill me. I didn't really get to take much time to mourn uh, before I jumped into that one. But again, that was a post Def Jux thing. And that was, again, one of the things that was about the end of the label. Because by the time I had gotten to that record, I didn't trust even to put it out on my own label. I didn't trust that we were solid enough of a business to risk mm -hmm. putting that out on my own record label. I was like, I, this has to come out. It can't be bogged down in whatever fate the business of this label has right now. So I, I had to find a different home right. for it. While we're while we are in that Ohio sort of a connection, you know, it's probably a good time to talk about mm. RJ as well. It doesn't sound like he necessarily came with Camus, right? Mm -hmm. Even though like they were all rocking together. It it seems like that's a little bit of a different path. Can you walk us through you linking up with RJ? I knew about RJ through them, through Camus and copyright. Okay. And it was really copyright who was like, yo, you should check out our producer's shit. He's got some little shit, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And I was like, all right, cool. And he sent me this, what was it? I don't know, a CD. <laughs> <laughs> this really fucking great instrumental music. And I remember talking to him and just, and being like, this is really fucking good. I would put this shit out if you didn't sample 60 bars of Grover Washington Jr. You know, like, he was like, <laughs> you know, he was making whatever he wanted. He, was, he wasn't no, in, he the wasn't in the business yet, so he wasn't too much considering. He wasn't yet. in the business. He was still in it for the 100% for the art. He was making collage art. He was really good at it. And um, he was making these sort of soulful compositions, but using a shit ton of, of samples in a big way. Mm -hmm. Not all of it, but some of it where you were just like, holy shit. <laughs> if, if, <laughs> if you were a producer and you knew these records, you were like, oh, damn, like I can't ever put that out. It was just clear to me that he had a, um, that he had a really dope touch and perspective and it was soulful and it was compositional he was making jams i knew about him because of the one jam that he did i think it was called june it was a copyright verse about his father right yeah, passing yeah, yeah, yeah. i think yeah and it was this long instrumental and it, and it went off into a tangent and then came back and then copyright rap again Why JT2 drop that shit so I can drop my thoughts Drifting away in the press or with the listening range Nah, but for real, I got so much shit on my mind From fake motherfuckers to my future, I'm trying to get in line And I'm, you know, I was just really impressed by it So I think that that was sort of like the gateway I asked, I asked about him and, and he was like, you should listen to this shit I hit him up like, you want to do this? And at that point, yeah. it was pretty easy And If I ever wanted to reach out to anybody because I liked their shit It was a pretty easy yes at that point, because Def Jux was popping. We hadn't missed. People really liked the output, the shows and the community and the whole vibe and everything was really solid. And I, I didn't get too many no's. There were a couple of no's that I got. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it was just like, you want to do some shit? And it was like, yeah, that same shit with Ace. It was like, you want to do this? And he was like, yes. Well, I think that's that's a perfect segue then. Aesop Rock's got to be considered a tentpole of, of Def Jux. How did you come in contact with Aesop? I think that's that's first important. Kind through of through um, my friend and publicist Catherine Fraser, who I still gotcha. is still my friend and publicist to this year and to this day. She was his publicist, so she was trying to get me up on him. But also, I was just hearing his name. He was getting shit played on Stretch and Bob. People right. were talking about him. I kind of missed sort of the first wave of it like the earthworm music mm -hmm. for earthworms shit flow was the one that i got into it with and it was funny because people didn't have the vocabulary to describe ace that much to me except to say like it sounds like kind of like he's on some company flow shit but he's not there wasn't all the, the gradient of style yeah yet. it wasn't on the so grid if you heard yeah, someone who was wordy yeah. you immediately said it sounds like this even if it didn't sound like that right to his credit, if it had sounded like that, I wouldn't be into it. I would be like, nah, fuck that shit. <laughs> right. um, so it, it didn't sound like that. Obviously, it sounded very unique and ill. I saw how much people were into it, and I knew people that I knew were just bringing him off and shit. It was a very unique thing that he was doing, and also he was self-contained. Like He really had his own crew. I'm, I'm really interested in that part, right? Because Labor Day's Bazooka Tooth, None Shall Pass, like... Mostly uh, blackhead producing, Ace himself, 
and then you doing a couple here uh, and there, yeah. You know, a, mm-hmm. a song or two, right? I'm really curious of what that process was like in terms of you know y'all y'all got the hub where everybody's making shit over at you know Def Chuck's headquarters, which is your crib. Is Ace and Blockhead are they just making records and bringing them like this is what we doing? Yeah. Or how, how does how did how was that? How was that? Yeah, process? the first the first couple of records that was exactly what it was. I think what was the first record was what mm-hmm. uh, Labor Day. Who put the monkey wrench in well oil perfection and step up just to watch these monitors spit white noise through your office space? Automator, I affect Dolly G, pull the Senate cloud clusters, brush and dust mites off your stomach, and all revolution sound jugglers. So they, yeah, they, they, um, yeah, they did that shit themselves. I mean, I didn't touch that record. And was that, was that like the first shit that you put out that you didn't really have a hand in though? Like, yeah, maybe it is. Every other record, probably almost every other record at that point has. Even Lyft's EP had a jam from me on. Jam. It's dope to hear that you didn't think twice about it, because that means like you were just like, this is dope. I'm putting and this shit out. And that's and all it was. It was fucking successful. And that's successful. all it was. That's all I yeah. cared about. I just I, I wanted to fuck with dudes who were, were dope. If they could be on that level, it had nothing to do with me. That, that wasn't the point. Originally, the point was that I had music that I was making with people. Right. It was like a natural fit. It just was a natural fit in the, in, the, in the crew. Pretty immediately, you could tell that he had like a really rabid fan base. People really connected yeah. with his particular vibe and like the way that he thought, the way that he presented his shit. I think that that was the point of Jux for me was I wanted to rally behind motherfuckers who were carving their lanes. One of the things that I always appreciated about Ace was that like me and like everybody else, just like us, encyclopedia understanding and, and experience with the same stuff that i love i'm a few years older than ace i think i'm three years older than ace or something in terms of like our influence and our taste right. he's right there and i really felt that at the point at that point we were the best place to possibly bring something that was challenging but also fucking funky rugged funky <laughs> rugged but it, you know ace brought a different vibe him and block had brought a different vibe because block's beats were pretty a lot of them were pr- were yeah, pretty. You know were, what I mean? They were they were um, they were bouncy and pretty, and it wasn't the same jaggedness that 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 I brought. Yeah. You know. But it was, um, so it was, it was interesting because it was like not necessarily something that like I would have known that I would like. And it took me a minute to digest it. I think I was a little late on it because I was in my own head about music and doing, doing a different type of thing. And when I finally really listened, I was like, okay, yeah. But you know, it's one thing that's really interesting too is like, you know, you had him on a lot of your records, you usually had a joint or two on his and not, you know, he sounds great over your production and y'all voices sound super dope mm. together. Mm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like y'all really compliment each other. So it leads me to wonder, was there ever plans for y'all to do like a whole album together in that, in that cycle when, when y'all was. No, we, 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 we had a, you know, at a certain point, Ace became an honorary member of the Weathermen, which was the crew that me and Kamu yeah. and Cage and, Tame One and Breeze Bruin and Yak and then Ace came on and we always planned or thought that we were going to do like a big crew album. Those plans disintegrated pretty much when Kamu died. Mm -hmm. So, Well then I think uh, a a good place to go from there uh, is another solo artist that was on the label. Somebody that you did do a bunch of production for um, but I'm curious on how you linked up with him and what the working relationship was like because I think he was based out of Boston the majority of the time. Uh, who's Mr. Liff, the very first artist released on Def Chuck's records. Me and Liff became friends. We just immediately liked each other. We did a company flow show in Boston. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that me and Liff met each other at the show where company flow broke up on the train. <laughs> like we went out, <laughs> straight up, like we went out to Boston <laughs> to do a show. And I might be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure that that's where we met. We were on a train going to Boston. Is, is this either one of two train rides? It's either the one where Company Flow broke up on the way on the way and just got off of the train, <laughs> and and then and then I had to do the show by myself, or it's the one where we saw the aftermath of someone who had been hit by the train. Um, one or the other. Oh, all right. I'll never forget this shit. Company Flow. We were doing the um, Emma and Burners. 
single, right? And I had spent, yeah, and yeah, we yeah. had gotten this piece from phase, from phase two. And um, I had spent like 48 hours <laughs> sitting up with the, with the graphic designer at, at Rockets, trying to put the whole shit together. Just was nowhere to be found. Sitting there, I'm making choices and shit. You know what I mean? Like I'm by myself, like making choices yeah. and shit. And I was exhausted. And then we had to go do a show the next day. And we on the train and shit. And then me and Just got into some argument about it because he looked at it and he like shitted on it. And I was like, well, motherfucker, he went. You know, ah. and we got into some some argument. I was like, fuck you. And he was like, fuck you. And he got up and he bounced. That so wasn't the last time that we had rocked together, but that was the <laughs> first, the first breakup. Anyway, point being, I did a show in Boston and I met Liff and he was just such a fucking wonderful human right from the bat. And he came into the city one time and we just hung out and freestyled and like I played him some beats and shit. And we just became really quick friends. I mean, if you know Liff, Liff is just one of the most genuine humans. I don't know if you've have had the chance to really talk to Liff or whatever. We've talked on the internet. We, I, we haven't really met in person. Ever. Right, right, right. You know, Liff is one of the truest, just most gentle hearted, good people that I know. And um, I very much love that dude. Um, to this day, we, we, we still up. speak. And, you know, it's all a little bit of a blur, but I mean, it was just like, it was sure. just like right away, man. We just liked each other. So he was one of the first people that I stepped to when the shit was popping off. I, was, I wanted to speak to the two big LPs y'all put out together. Cause the first one was an EP. And I think that was before the Def Jux machine really started like cranking mm -hmm. and rolling. But when it's humming, y'all put out, you know, I Phantom and y'all put out Mo mm -hmm. Mega. Did he come to New York to make those records with you? Or how did, he how did. did that process he go did. forward? He did. Yeah. Um, he came to New York to make I Phantom. He didn't make all of I Phantom in New York, but a huge chunk of it he made. I, I did a huge chunk of that record. Mm -hmm. And then he did some stuff in Boston and he did some stuff um, elsewhere. But but the, the, the next, and that was and that was great. And that, and that record hit. Seconds after I've been swept off my feet. Open through the doors and in steps the beat Complete with medical packs and four fours Looked at me and said, damn, this nigga needs God Born a part in the street, he got beat The meat are disenfranchised and left weak Beat, these images I couldn't ignore Personas of the rhythm who just walked in the store the And like for us, for the indie scene, there was like a hit And he was off and running And he, he, he you know, he, he was, um, lived definitely was in the pillars of the Def Jux sort of yep. success stories. That record did really well. And then Mo Mega was tougher. Mm -hmm. Liff wanted to do another record. I wanted to do another record with Liff. I forget why there was a bit of a rush and his plans had kind of fallen apart. He was, at the time, maybe he was trying to do it with Idan as a primary producer. I don't remember exactly, but for some reason, it was sort of a last minute decision for me to do the record. I was kind of like, all right, I'll do the record. Fuck it. Mm -hmm. It was a little tough on us. Mm -hmm. It was a struggle. Me and him were getting into arguments and shit. You know what I mean? By this point, I had just done so mm -hmm. many bangers. I, I just expected full trust. And I think that Liff has what we call demo-itis sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, the way that I produce people often is that I give you something just to kind of get you inspired and get you rapping. And, and, and then you do your job, and then I take what you did, and I completely destroy it. I take everything that you thought the song was and I just put a whole other thing underneath it, you know, because then I have my time to like really think about the music. Yeah. It's a great system if you're me. It can be a harrowing system if you're an artist and you're like, but I like that thing that I rapped on. Right. You know if, what I mean? You were, you were married to the original version you laid down as an MC. Right. It'd be kind of tough to wrap your head around a new version. Exactly. Exactly. For some reason, we just didn't have a good time. And even though I thought that the shit that we were making was, was ill. I remember he really didn't feel good about that record, even though I would say objectively it had some of the hardest shit that he had done and some of yeah. my favorite beats that I've done. But it was because the experience was bad. It was because I kind of quit on him a couple of times during it, like on mm -hmm. my like, fuck this shit. It was during a time when um, the Def Jack shit was weighing on me. There was just a lot going on. I wasn't in a good place. And I always felt terrible about that because it affected his perspective on that record. You know, and I say this because I can say this, like this is my, my, one of my closest friends, you know? Right. He's such a good dude that if he has a bad association or, or like an argument or association with something that he can't fully enjoy it. He's about the experience as much as he is about the result. And I'm not as much, you know, to some degree I am, but I'm also kind of on some like, you know, hey, whatever we had to fucking get through or go through to get the result, 
that's the story of the record. There's no guarantee that making art is going to be fun all the time or that it's not going to put you through the, through the grinder a little bit or that you're not going to have these moments of, of doubt or conflict or whatever. And whatever that is, is your experience. Art is a reflection of not what we want to be, but what we are. You know? mm-hmm. And at least that's the type of bullshit I tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then I numb myself. <laughs> Oh, it's fucking great. Um, Hold on, let me recharge on bullshit. Let me just... <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to take a quick sec and talk about MERS. MERS isn't necessarily somebody, when you ask him about Def Jux, might, he might not be the first name, second name, third name that comes out of somebody's mouth, but I think that like... Oh, he was important for Jux, though, man. Yeah, and I think where I, where I was sitting in Chicago and, and in college at the time and ultimately being out here in L.A., like that was a big move in like expanding what Def Jux meant to me psychologically. Mm. Like, oh, this is a this ain't just a you know five boroughs thing or mm. even just like a New York and Ohio thing. Like mm. this is this is a, a big thing. How did you end up linking up with, with MERS? And I think it's a really that you know that's an important story to illuminate just because he's a LA dude. A lot of out of towners can't handle this city where you wear the wrong color and it can't get tricky. But that was '86. Totally, I met Merz in the in, in the early company club days, just going out to the West Coast, and we 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 ended up um like going out to the Bay. Merz was in the Bay for a minute. Yeah, we met the Living Legends dudes. They were like the indie guys hustling and and you know on the West Coast, and yep. um, we were the indie dudes from the East Coast. And so there was a mutual respect immediately. But those guys were hustling on a on a level that was really granular. It was when I met those dudes, they were hustling out of their backpacks. Yep, literally hand to hand on the street. Hey, hey, you want to check my shit out? Ten bucks. And these dudes were making money doing that shit. And they had the same sort of pride that we did in terms of like, no one's giving this shit to us. We're taking it. It's ours. You know, I'm hustling for me. And Merce in particular was just a dude that me and him just connected. I don't know. We're both Pisces, you know? Um, <laughs> but people don't realize Merce was the crazy one. He was the crazy one for a yeah. long time. Merce now, he's like the responsible one. He's, he's like chill, the dad. Man. You know what I mean? He's <laughs> chill. He's kind of like the, kind of like the elder statesman. Merce used to be the dude that you thought was going to just get into a fight with 10 people at Denny's, you know, like, because <laughs> I think that me and him just immediately clicked because we both had a little bit of a crazy streak and we had a similar sense of humor. And um, I always told him I wanted to do a record with him. And I really loved his solo records that he put out on, on his own. And I just thought that he was ill. I ended up stepping in. To me, it was obvious. To me, it was like, oh, this is a dude who's, just putting out great albums on his own. Uh, you know, he's always making noise, even in our in our world. But for some reason, no one had ever stepped to him with any type of real deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, again, you know, we were friends. So yeah, doing doing the record with him was amazing. And, and we did the end of the beginning. Mm-hmm. We did um, you get um, you know, three sixteen, the ninth edition. Uh, mm-hmm. What was the other? One? Yeah, end of the beginning. Those are the two listed on Wikipedia. Okay, all right. Maybe those were the two. I thought we did a third one, but but you know, Wikipedia is what, do I, what being, do I know for being bulletproof. So you know, <laughs> Wikip- I literally checked Wikipedia once, like twenty years ago, <laughs> because and, and like the but I like checked my like my entry. Yeah. And the first thing it said was that I was from Queens, and I was like, okay, I'm never yeah, looking at this. Again. <laughs> <laughs> but you said Merz was important to the label. Uh, I'd love to hear. From what perspective? Because Merce, similar to me in some ways, but in his own way, Merce was a leader. Mm. Uh, and when you have a crew of people and it's just sort of one guy kind of in that position to some degree who's got a little bit of an OG status at that point, it really helps you get a, another one around. Mm. For the sake of the um, the sort of the harmony and the mental state of the crew, right. Merce was a leader and, and had some real experience under his belt. And I always knew that him being around was, was a positive thing for people. And Merce, uh, apart from just being such a dull presence in music and just being such a, a good dude and hilarious and raw, again, this was all stuff that I was into. It was all relationships that came from me, apart from a few degrees of separation for a few people. Mm-hmm. Merce is one of the ones that came, that was one of the purest ones that came like from the fact that I met this dude in 1997 and we got drunk at Denny's. 
versus just a dope presence, man. I think he's just someone that you want to be around. You know, he's he's fucking hilarious, and he's on his shit. Like he's trying to, and, do you know, and you know what else he is? He's he's like he's like fucking blatantly honest too. Like he is oh, a straight shooter, no, and, and especially because I, you know, out here in L.A. where you just don't get that. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? He is oh, a straight yeah. shooting this motherfucker in the world, which is you know another reason I like to be around him. Which makes him crazy. Yeah. Absolutely. Like it's like <laughs> because it's not like he's actually crazy, but when somebody is that goddamn honest, mm-hmm. it looks like they're taking liberties with the way that you're supposed to operate in life. Needless to say, mercy is a force of nature. I mean, he's been around as long as I have. He's a little younger, but he's been doing, making noise as long as I have. He's been doing this as long as I have, I think. To see him go from indie hustling, you know, on the West Coast in the in the late 90s to then becoming like this figurehead and putting together the festival hey, that he put together for so many, for so many years um, and seeing how much he has always tried to show support and love for people and tried to do what he could to boost people up around him. Mercer's never just about himself. And I, you know, admire that and relate to that to some degree. I listen, Mercer saying that he wanted to quit when we did the first album. Right. When I did the first album with this dude on Def Jux, he was like, yeah, this is a perfect way. Like there are a couple people who looked at Jux like their swan song. <laughs> like, when he got on Jux, he was like, and this will be my final album, you know? And, and I was like, word? He was like, yep, that's it for me. You know, I've done it. And of course, that was bullshit. And of he just course, kept making record is. after record after record. And it was still, and he was still good. He's still dope today. And like, but he, every time he did a record, it was his last record. I was Merce. Merce was just like, this is it for me. You know, that's it's over. Hilarious. Yeah, it's hilarious. That's why I never say that shit. Yeah, I just can't. want, when it's, when it's going to be my last record, I just want to just go. Yep. <laughs> just, disappear. Disappear. Just disappear, yeah. That's my hope. That's my dream. <laughs> um, one more artist I wanted to touch on uh, is one you mentioned earlier, Cage. Mm-hmm. Um, man, K- it's 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 always interesting for me to think of Cage because the first Cage shit I heard was like you know it was like ninety seven. It was around then too, and it's you know the Agent mm-hmm. Orange Radiohead, and I'm mm-hmm. like, what the fuck? Death for all. Right, 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 right. right. Against your machine like rage. Bitches say I hate you, Cage. After circle jerks, I wash my hands off and do dirt. Sit with a slight plus happy to serve. Brain exploded with hearing like the hardest. Yeah, the like hardest the persona, shit. like the 20 yeah. overdubs and shit. I'm like, right. yo, this is crazy. Grimy. Um, yeah. Just, just filthy, grimy rap. Yeah, he was ill. And that was uh, part of the whole stretch and bop scene. You know, mm. he put that record out with Bob, the Agent Orange record. I knew Cage before that. Okay. I knew Cage in 1995. Mm. Cage was at my crib when we lived in uh, in that loft I was telling you about. Mm-hmm. He came down and hung out for two weeks. We made jams together. Uh, I, I produced shit for him. I wasn't really a producer yet at that point. Though. You know, so Stretch Armstrong was like, yo, you got to meet Cage. And I was like, all right, cool. And... I didn't know anything about him except he was on the um, Pete Nice record. Mm-hmm. I knew that shit. And he came, I met him, and he came and hung out with us for two weeks. I think we smoked dust and Fun. maybe made like two, yeah, maybe made like two demos that never <laughs> went anywhere. Um, and, uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't until years later that we became friends. Really. Mm-hmm. I've always been interested as a producer and just getting down with people. If I can, if I can be part of the moment in which you surprise everybody. Mm-hmm. So I felt that way as well with like doing rap music for Killer Mike. Flying in the face of expectation, people kind of think that they know you and then you show them something that they hadn't seen before. And that was what the vibe was of the Cage record. There was a lot of discussion about it between me and him. And there was this story that Cage had that I knew about that about his life that he had never put on on record really he was sort of holding it for himself but it felt like he was ready to start going there and we were like all right well let's make something that i think people will look at and be surprised that it came from you because they haven't heard it yet which is such a cool thing to be down with because it's obviously it's his story so just to even be able to like be a part of that moment for somebody is, is cool. And that was what Hell's Winter was yeah. about. Obviously, that was the one that I had as much hand in as I could. 
came to fill him with pain Take a print of my brain Flash it on the screen You won't leave the cinema sane Had a following Fondling it wouldn't let go Till I spiked the easy football Into the deaf jokes end zone And when it hit the grass It covered the crowd with mud Mom slipped my bare ass out I covered the ground with blood Then she wiped it on my face Like war paint Then slapped me I cry I'ma die with a hardcore brain But um Yeah And uh I don't know what I'm. I, you have. You do know I've been smoking weed, right? Yes. <laughs> and, yeah. and that's that's, that's what that's, that's what that's, that's what makes it. That's what's in the apple. Ama- well, no, I thought you, maybe you were just smoking apple seeds. I thought there was some new shit out there, but no, I, I did. I did figure that. But um, that's what makes this even more incredible that you're still able to remember what question I've asked you, <laughs> like from minute to minute. That's actually pretty pretty amazing. I mean, I'm I'm drifting. <laughs> I, you know, at a certain at a certain point, I was really just relating to what I was saying. I which wasn't, is, I wasn't. Which is what, which is what we're here for. But um, <laughs> but I do think um, you know, it's interesting for you to say that because I think that you know, there's there's parallels in you leaning into your own personal shit on starting with company flow and then later on, you know, in in terms of your own solo work too, where you have like, yeah, you got the the raw b boy shit, which is what we knew Cage is for the raw, mm-hmm. grimy shit. Um, mm-hmm. you know, smut peddlers like all that type of shit. But then, you mm-hmm. know, there's this moment where he does want to lean in more personal. And I think, you know, with yeah. the journey that you had, you're the perfect producer to kind of bring that forward. Yeah, I felt like I got it. And I felt I felt like um I, yeah, I think that, that was a, a great record. Yep. Uh, so, you know, just, just to round things out, man, to bring it back, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, oh, it sucks. Cause I feel like I could talk about all this shit for like a million years, but eventually we have to talk about like the rest of your career. So, you know, yeah. in, in service to that, man, we, we got to talk about, you know, what led to ultimately closing the doors of Def Jux, which, you know, publicly that's related to, you know, business it's related to, you know, not enough money coming in to keep keep the doors open me and you have talked about this primarily as a creative endeavor Mm. and i'm interested in at what point you had to start paying attention to the numbers and 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 not able to be fully uh about the creative well man i mean it was it was something that presented itself in the last you know couple years Mm -hmm. we did just for 10 years yeah and um I don't remember exactly. A lot of it I've blocked out of my, my sure. head yeah. in terms of detail. But I just remember that it started getting harder to pay the bills. All that shit is real. All that shit is true. And it's dry and it's boring. But I mean, you know, again, the story's out there. But it's the same story that a lot of other record labels have had, unfortunately. No matter how many times you hear the story, you're not prepared for when it happens to you, which is that you grew bigger, but now you're, you're making less money. So you don't know how to keep the shit afloat. Mm-hmm. And um, that's the business part of it. And then and that ended up being something that ultimately is the reason why the door closed. Mm-hmm. Because we couldn't live up to what our end of the bargain anymore. We couldn't keep it afloat. But then there was a parallel thing which was going on, which was which is me, which is that I was in a bad place. I, I was wrecked from the Camus shit for mm-hmm. sure. It had taken a lot of toll on my myself, on my relationships with a lot of the people around me, just in terms of it being a cloud. Just a lot of uh, unhappiness, feeling like I was not able to even have some time to do what I wanted to do creatively. Like I had started the label with all the best intentions, but it was taking me a long time to make records because I was spreading myself really thin and I was investing myself not only in terms of my time, but also emotionally in other people's records and shit. And it was hard too, you know? I wasn't necessarily ready to be the dude that people were like, I'm the fuck you, I'm not happy. And I'm like, ah, fuck, here we go. You know, like, and if you, you try you try and do it correctly, you know, you try and do what you can to, do, to be honorable about it, and even in the face of your fuck ups. And it's like, yo, you're not happy, I'm not happy either. Mm-hmm. Straight up, no doubt. There was just lo- less and less happy for me with all mm-hmm. shit. I was just like, you know, this is great, and I'm glad I was a part of this. But the time for me to be able to be this person that's needed for this gig right here, I, I couldn't do it anymore. It wasn't it wasn't right for me for my mental health. It wasn't right for my music. I couldn't make enough music, and I was dealing with grief and I was dealing with stress mm-hmm. simultaneously, and also I was broke. Word. So it was, it was, you know, it was a tough combination of things. And, and I think about this, I don't know if I would have had the strength to say Death Jokes is dead because I kept that company alive um, purely with like, <laughs> like intention, you know Force what I mean? Will, like it yeah. was like 
force of will, it had become conflated in my head with if this doesn't work, then I fail and the mile shit is, is, is bullshit. Right. And it wasn't working. It was starting to become impossible. Everything was putting out a fire. It was an emergency. It was paying a bill. <laughs> you know, it was like, how we, you know, you borrow some money to pay some money. And that's like the American way and shit. But eventually, if you're a sensitive artist and you're <laughs> trying to fucking, you know, you're trying to like live, they might fuck with you. Combine with, combine that with a healthy dose of drugs and, and alcohol and you've got yourself a classic meltdown on the, you know, right, <laughs> on the happen. way. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, so sometimes I'm like, oh, thank God. Thank God this shit just didn't work financially because I don't know if I would have, I don't think I would have wanted to subject anyone to the meltdown that was probably going to come. Here's a, a question though. So you said like it's a classic story. Label gets too big, but it's making less money. Can you help? Like walk me through like and not not in terms of any particular projects or anything like that, but like what is the mechanism by which you start making less money after you get a certain size? Like I don't like people gotcha, stopping gotcha. buying physical product. Gotcha. It was right at that point when the shit went boosh in terms of people buying physical, right. and streaming was not generating the money that it is today. Right, they had that hadn't been figured out yet. It just wasn't big enough. It right. wasn't big enough. So you're selling less physical. But the money wasn't being made up for the way it's supposed to. It's like, all right, if we're not doing physical, we got to get paid digitally, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right. So it took a long time, man. So only in the last, like, I would say five, six years, maybe more, maybe seven, has, has it really become what it is to the industry. And um, we were right in that sweet spot, like a lot of labels were, where it just it definitely hit. And we were putting records out that weren't doing well. And we were stacked up. That's why I say it's a classic story because that's happened to a lot of labels. You kind of blow up and then you're like, fuck, I guess we should hire people to do stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you do it. And then you're a real record label with real bills and real and real payroll and all that shit. And then the chart starts to go like this. So you had more money in the beginning when you had nobody and we're just randomly selling records. It's economics, man. Mm -hmm. It's economics. It couldn't work out anymore. And it was tough. I felt very personally responsible for everything because I had told people, roll me, I'm going to do this. And I wanted to do it right. And so it was a tough thing to deal with. But at the same time, I knew that there was this other voice in me, which mm -hmm. was like, um, you're not making music, man. Like, mm -hmm. you're not, there was just something telling me. And, and I had lost a little bit of the magic of the whole thing when Kamu died. And right. uh, as I think did everybody. I really do. Yeah, it was just tough on everybody. And it was tough on the relationship for everybody. Uh, just to, just to end this off the best we can, like, you know, speaking to you now and I, and I, and Damn, am I, tell, am I telling a depressing story right now? <laughs> I mean, it's the truth. Yes. It's just sometimes the truth is it's fucking the truth. dark. You know what I'm saying? And I think, and I think that's like, that's, that's good for everybody to hear, man. People fucking love this music. People have all of these thoughts and feelings about some shit that they were in no way actually connected to. So it's great to hear like, you know, what happened and get that insight into it. And speaking to you now, you know, I know you go through the shit you go through, but you don't seem fucking, you don't seem n anywhere near as close to the bottom <laughs> as you were then. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, I think, I think it Thanks, might be man. good. Yeah, for, I'm shredding. <laughs> it might be good for people to hear, like, just if as, as, as much as you could sum it up the path back to some sort of fucking balance after you were in that space. I can look back at it now and look back at those relationships and those moments and those and as like this amazing period of time in which I got to do art with people that I really wanted to do art with. And there was an excitement and a thrill about it. And I think that we represented something really good. And I also am really glad that I could personally just fucking recognize finally when it was time to move on, quite honestly. And it's not something I can look back on and um, regret in any way because I feel really lucky to have been around and to have been in contact with a lot of these people, especially at certain moments in their artistic careers. I wouldn't trade that. Mm -hmm. That being said, you're right. I am not anywhere near as rock bottom as I, as I was. And <laughs> that was hard fought. You know what I mean? I went through a lot to get there. It was like, you know, I was a little bit lost after that whole shit. Yeah. Um, after that whole thing, um, you know, went down and I kind of, this thing I worked on for like 10 years just was gone. And I just was at a crossroads. It was a rough year, maybe right, you know, the year after Jokes went under essentially where we had to shutter the doors. 
and you know, I, I didn't have any dough. Mm-hmm. I didn't have any dough and I didn't have any direction. I was definitely, you know, living on, off, uh, you know, uh, an egg sandwich a day and facing like for the first time being like, well, what the, f- you know, what the fuck am I going to do? And, um, yeah, the, the strain of, 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 of all of that stuff and the reality has left me in a little bit of a humble place, mm-hmm. I think. And it really changed me. Uh, I feel like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky that it happened to me when it did. I think that I needed to change. And of course, look, I'm just saying my perspective. Yeah, the story. Yeah, yeah. My story about it is that I needed to take a step back. I needed to stop everything and yeah. just think about music again. And, and it was something that I discovered about myself. I don't want to get super fucked up anymore because now I can make music and I don't want to fucking, I was filling my time with a whole bunch of negative shit at the end. You know, for a while I was really just kind of trying to lose myself. It all basically, like I said, led to the, the realization that for me, it was just about music and it's always been about music. And that's why I really focus my time on that now, truly and you know, purely as I can. You don't have to argue about it. I don't have to question it. I don't have to, you know, it's there. It's, it's what I've always wanted. And it's there for me. So I'm very lucky. I'm lucky, man, because I got to I got to shift and have that realization. If I hadn't had that realization, then I don't think you would have heard on the jewels. You wouldn't have heard my next solo record. So um, I had all these fears and shit. I was like, I didn't know if anyone wanted to fuck with me anymore. Mm -hmm. If maybe my time had passed, if maybe the sound was never going to really click with anyone beyond who it had clicked with. Once you get uh, humbled a little bit as an adult you kind of lose your fear of that shit again. You know, you like remember what it's like to not have any money again. Mm. You know, you're like, oh, right. I spent plenty of time not having any money. (laughs) I know. You know what I mean? Like I can deal with it. (laughs) Like I'll I'll, I'll work my way out, you know, uh, out of this. And my whole point is I don't look at it bitterly. I don't look at it. um, I look at it for what it was, which was uh, just a fucking experiment for 10 years. That was amazing. Had amazing moments. And you know, also had really hard moments. Yeah. And I think, you know, even it just for the sake of these conversations, like I said, could talk about this forever, but I do think it's important to close the door on it so we can move on to actually talking about music again. You know what I'm saying? I just want you to be able to move on. <laughs> That's really the... <laughs> I'm only talking about this for 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 therapeutic sake for you. <laughs> but I, I I appreciate you know your willingness to be vulnerable about times that were obviously like as as amazing as they were. They were also not fucking easy. We there were plenty of not. There was plenty of not easy, and yeah. you know that's a fact. You're either mm-hmm. one of those people who kind of tends to incorporate the past towards something you know that you feel like you can build on. Or sometimes I think certain people are inclined to just fucking resent the past. That's not my inclination. I'm glad to hear that and we were able to spend a little time with it. Um, and then next time we pick up with the with the next episode, we'll be able to move on into talking Wait, about- Wait, but hold on. I haven't told you about when I really hit rock bottom. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll be able to talk about uh, some, more, some more music. Um, which, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that as well, man. This is a great chapter. It, it was a very important chapter for me as a fan. Fortunately, you have a lot more story to tell. And I'm, I'm really excited to get to that shit, too. too, too. Stony Island Audio.